All right, I'm going to bring Doug in here. Hello, and welcome to our second episode of the series Grow with Katie Live at Homestead Gardens. I've got my friend Doug Tallamy here, and we are, this is an educational video series, but it's also an interactive video series. We want to hear from you guys out there, and we want to interact with you. We want all of your burning questions, but first let me introduce Doug, because you might not know even know what to ask him, although my guess is you know Doug if you're tuning in. Um, Doug, we have a very inspiring topic today that is near and dear to my heart is Doug's life work and his passion. And I know a lot of you out there, you're very passionate about it too. We've got Doug Tallamy, who is a professor of entomology at University of Delaware, where you've worked for 40 years, right, Doug? That is right. right. <laughs> and um, you say that with such, wow, has it been 40 years? It's been a, it's been a good good place to be. Yeah, I know it has. And um, you are a bug champion, and you have told me that you were born liking nature. That's correct. Nobody yeah. had to teach me. Nope, <laughs> nobody had to teach you. And I, it, you know, those kids out there. Raise your hand, raise your virtual hand if you were one of those kids who love to dig in the dirt, love to play with worms and um, investigate all the little things that were going on underground. So um, that was certainly me. I am guilty of that. And um, it, it creates this lifelong learning and lifelong passion for kids, I think, when we cultivate that. Doug, I once um, had a friend who told me her kid liked worms and she was disgusted by it. And I was like, you've got to let him dig in the dirt. So um, anyway, let me, let me, let's welcome Doug. Everyone out there, please say hi to Doug. We're so happy to have you. Hey. Hello. Hello. And I hope this goes better. Doug, if you remember, I'm going to knock on wood. The last time you and I talked, you lost power. Uh, yeah. yeah. This technology doesn't work. But we'll <laughs> Doug, yeah, there you go. You were a little bit to, to center, left of center or right of center. Right, right. There you go. Move. Yeah, there you go. You're better. We want to see your whole face. Um, hey, Arlena, we're happy you're here. So let me introduce Doug. As I said, he, you're a professor in the Department of e Entomology and Wildlife Ecology. And your goal, your research goal, well, I read it, took it from your website. Would you rather tell us what your goal is, your mission in life? No, you do. Okay. <laughs> His goal is to better understand the many ways that insects interact with plants and how those interactions determine diversity. And that last part is something key that we'll talk about today is the different types of diverse species. And Doug, you often say that when you studied entomology in school, you learned about bugs, but you did not learn about plants and how the bugs interact with the plants. And that is something key that I think Doug brought to us. He was the author of Bringing Nature Home back in 2007. And I think for many of you out there, myself included, it was that wake up call that we needed to say, this is enough. Change needs to happen. These expansive um, law yards with just lawns and green grass that we over fertilize needs to stop. I know you guys are tuning in from Homestead Gardens, which is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Maryland is one of those states that I think is leading the way, Doug, in protection of our species. Uh, there's a lot of products that you guys already can't use. So thank you for you guys in Maryland being champions for our wildlife. I wish the rest of the country would follow suit. But it is a necessity that we make a change. So bringing nature home, I think, was a wake up call for so many people. You also wrote Living Land, The Living Landscape and then your newest book, Nature's Best Hope. With Rick Dark. Don't forget Rick Dark. With Rick Dark. <laughs> yes, thank you. With Rick Dark. Um, and your newest book, uh, Nature's Best Hope, which I might run. I just left it in the other room as we were trying to troubleshoot here. Uh, do you have a copy handy or is yours in the other room, too? They're in the other room. <laughs> I went to Cindy, can you get a Nature's Best Hope at some point? Thank you, Cindy. Um, and that you guys can buy in the shop. Maybe Courtney will post a link to that. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at your local bookstore, um, or you can buy it at right? The Nature of Oaks. The Nature of Oaks. Now, Doug, do you remember my favorite joke? No. no. <laughs> what is the name? There There's the book. Oh, yes. Think there's what, best hope. Get your hands on it. It is a, a book that you will highlight and underline many, many times. All right, so here's my favorite joke. Doug, what is an acorn? I forget the punchline. <laughs> it's an oak tree in a nutshell. That's right. That's 
That's exactly what it is, yes. Yes, yes. So if you guys have any plant jokes out there, let us know. But let's get in the meat of the conversation. Doug, I, This before this conversation, we posted on uh, a native habitat group if people had any questions for you. And so we could fill this entire conversation with the questions that people asked. But let's jump in because I know that everyone's here to learn from you about how they can be nature's best hope. But since we, we just talked about your oak book, uh, let's start with oaks. And if you could give us some information about why oaks are really the most powerful you know, species in our landscape that we can put in our in our landscapes. Okay, let's go back to plants. What they do, they capture the energy from the sun, and they they use it for their own growth and reproduction. But they turn it into food. So that drives food webs that support all the animals on the planet. If animals don't eat the plants, they don't get that energy. Well, most animals don't eat plants. They eat something that ate plants, and that's something is oh, yeah. changing insects. And the insects that transport energy onto other animals are caterpillars. So if you want to have viable food webs in your landscape, you have to make caterpillars. This is where oaks come in. What makes the most caterpillars? If we look in 84% in of the counties of North America, oaks make uh, support more species of, of caterpillars than any other plant genus. 900 species across the country, 557 right here in the mid Atlantic states. Wow. So, so in terms of supporting life in your property, and, and if, you know, don't worry about anything other you can't do better than those. They will make the most That's one reason I like those. They also, they also sequester the most birds. They also have the biggest root system, so they help our watershed. Um, else to do. You know, they, they are wind pollinated. So we used to think they didn't help pollinators at all, but but now we're discovering insects don't pollinate oaks, but they do go and eat the pollen off those those catkins. So there are native bees that are covered with oak pollen. So apparently they are benefiting pollinators as well. Interesting, and they're very long lived. You know, I mean, we have an issue right. nowadays. I think with our some of the newly planted trees being planted the wrong way, or however people will plant their, their trees, especially in our urban landscapes. And um, they only last 15, 20 years, but oaks can live up to, I mean, if you treat, if you take good care of them, they can last for- A thousand years. Oh my Lord. All right, so they're, everyone's saying you're get, they're getting some feedback from you. So yeah. that it's kind of hard that they're getting a bad echo. Hmm. All right, let's see what we can do about that. Um, Maybe here. Try about. We still get it. Ooh, that's it's definitely sounds better to me. You guys out there, tell us if it sounds better to you, because you sounded very, you sounded a little bit louder there to me. Okay. So still we'll, getting feedback. Yeah, Alviva. All right. Well, we're gonna. Let, why don't we let you talk a little bit more and tell us about? Um, well, uh, another thing about oaks is if you, I mean, right now they're making acorns. Acorns are free. You can get your, your oak in a nutshell for free. And I recommend planting oaks young. The smaller, the better. An acorn is ideal, although you'll have to protect it, uh, the baby from, from deer, uh, because then it can establish its root system without, um, you know, without any interference. When we put it in a pot or if we dig it up and transplant it, we've, we've cut off the roots and it takes them a long time to rebuild those. So you'll get the, the happiest, healthiest, fastest growing oak by starting well, starting with an acorn or a small bare root plant um, that only costs a few few dollars. Do not buy a four or five inch caliber 15 foot oak tree. And, you know, you say, well, I'll get instant gratification, but uh, I can plant an acorn the same day you plant that tree. And in maybe eight, nine years, that acorn will pass your tree because your tree will just sit there trying to rebuild its root system. Or my acorn will have a big ridge system and it will it will go to town. I've done that wow. at, at home here. So wow, that is a great tip, you guys. Um, plant your acorns, and I think a lot of people really, you know, this, this instant gratification we yeah. want yeah. from our plants, and it's great to hear that when you establish a little plant, it will by far catch up to that big plant. I love that. Well, you can also enjoy the process. I mean, watch it sprout, watch it grow, look at all the things that use it. I've got a picture of a a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of a, a just sprouted uh, oak. So they wow. start to contribute immediately. Wow. And of I course, if that, that happens, don't worry about it. That's what the the oak's job Wait. is. They're supposed to, supposed to do that. Yeah. Well, Doug, everyone's saying our sound is much better now. So okay, we're good. good. Great. 
super good. All right, well, let's talk, let's jump into the book, Nature's Best Hope. It's such a wonderful title. You challenge us to each individual person, all of you out there listening, to be Nature's Best Hope. Spoiler alert, it is you. It can you be you. You are Nature's Best Hope. Yeah. Um, so, so why can every person's backyard make a difference? And front yard. And front yard. Thank you. <laughs> every inch of land you own. Because that is the land that you can manipulate right away. You don't need permission. Um, we can change. You can. There's four things I talk about uh, everybody doing. And, and one would be to shrink the area that's in line. You talked about all that lawn. Um, lawn isn't doing anything for us ecologically. Uh, I'm not saying get rid of your lawn. And the lawn you keep, you should manicure. You're still going to be a good citizen. You will be accepted in your, your neighborhood. But it's going to be less less lawn. Because we right now we have 40 million acres of lawn. That's the size of New England. It's a total deadscape. It's ruining our watersheds. Uh, so cut that area in half. How do you do that? The easiest way is to plant those trees. And then you build a bed around that tree. And pretty soon you got a lot less lawn. So your lawn should be swaths of, of grass that guard you through the, the landscape. Uh, but uh, you're going to cut it in half. That's, that's step one. Step two would be make sure you don't have any invasive ornamental plants on your yard. No burning bush, no calorie pear, um, no, no uh, uh, barberry, um, privet. I mean, the list goes on and on. Autumn olive, they all escape into our natural areas and, and they degrade them because what they do is they push out the native plants. Uh, and, you know, if, if these non-native ornamentals supported nature the way our natives do, our, our ecosystems would look different, but they'd function just as well. The problem is they don't support those, those caterpillars or other types of, of insects. And, you know, as E.O. Wilson told us in 1987, insects are the little things that run the world. We cannot afford to lose them, but if the headlines tell us we are losing them. This is not good. We've got 45% fewer insects today than we had 40 years ago on the planet. If they're the things that keep us alive, that's not good news. That's, no, not, that's good news. not that scary. Yeah. Um, so I did, I did well with, with students, we did a, a little study in Maryland and Delaware and Pennsylvania hedgerows, looking at caterpillars in hedgerows that are invaded by non-native plants and caterpillars or in hedgerows that are not invaded. And there was a 96% reduction in the biomass, the amount of energy those caterpillars brought to those hedgerows. That's a 96% reduction in, um, in bird food. If I said to you, your bank account has just decreased 96%, you would pay attention. You'd get it that that's not good. Well, our insects are the currency in our ecological bank account, and that's what's keeping us alive. And if everybody could internalize that, we'd say, this is, this is not tolerable. We have to turn it around. But here's the good news. You can turn it around. Yes. I'm looking at, at, at our yard. I've been counting the number of moth species, taking pictures of them. I'm up to 1,012 species. Wow. that are found right here, which is 37% of all the moth species found in Pennsylvania That's amazing. on one 240 thousandths of the area in Pennsylvania. And they're here because I put the plants back that they, that they need. And because yeah. there's that many uh, caterpillars here, that much bird food here, we've had 55 species of birds breed at our, at our property. Um, so it works. It works. It does. If you build it, they will come. And there's something about the backyards as well, Doug, is if you do it in your, the, the caterpillars, the moths, they can't travel far distances. So they need your backyard, the next person's backyard to be able to survive their migratory journeys. Right. Oh, that's why we're talking about why your nature's best hope. So that's something you can do right at home. You can, you can, it empowers you. If, if I said to you, I want you to solve climate change uh, today, and I'm going to come check tomorrow and measure what you've done not going to happen. But if you go out and plant that acorn or the oak tree or, or any of the other, I call them keystone plants, they're supporting most of those caterpillars. I can see that. I can measure that. Um, you know, in, in just a short period of time, we can measure all the life that comes there. We can start to count the extra birds that are in your, in your yard. And that's one person. You did that alone. You know, more than 85% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. Wow. If everybody did that on their own private property, we'd be 85% done. That's why your nature's best hope. And if you don't own property, because a lot of people don't, they live in cities, you can do these things in your nearest park or your preserve. They're all understaffed. Uh, they don't, they need volunteers. 
Uh, and, and, you know, they need direction too. They, everybody has these giant lawns so that people can play baseball and everything else. That's okay some places, but they have it all places, you know, as if yeah. that's the only thing you do with a, a park. Um, so these are, this is why everybody can contribute. Everybody on the planet needs healthy ecosystems to survive. You know, it's, it's, it's what we need. So why doesn't everybody on the planet have the, the, um, the responsibility of being a good earth stewardship? If we all need healthy ecosystems, why wasn't, wouldn't everybody take care of them? Right now we have, it, it's specialized. You've got ecologists and a few conservation biologists and they're the only people worried about it. That's not enough. Everybody's got, got to be conscious of these things. So we're gonna yes. shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in those powerhouse plants, keystone plants like oaks. We're gonna build pollinator gardens. Why do we need pollinators? Because everybody says, well, because they pollinate our crop plants. That's not the reason. They pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we didn't have pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Forget our Including crops. Including coffee, I mean, people. That coffee. Is, yeah, that is not an option. And where do we need pollinators? Everywhere. Everywhere where you need plants, which is everywhere, not just in our parks and our preserves. That means you have to have, you have to have good pollinator habitat at home. Okay, who's our pollinator? 4,000 species of native bees. We do have one honeybee. They'll benefit too. So you put in the plants that support these bees um, and, and the best plants to support our native bees are the bees, they're, are the plants they're specializing on. 35% mm -hmm. of our native bees, and figure out what 35% of 4,000 is, require the pollen from only one genus of plants. You gotta have that, that plant genus. And around here, goldenrod, asters, um, the perennial sunflowers, native willows, those are the mm -hmm. best in terms of supporting specialist pollinators. Okay, so we're gonna have pollinator gardens. We're gonna have shrink the lawn. Um, we're gonna get rid of our invasive species and we're gonna put in those, those keystone plants. That's it, you're done. Easy peasy, you guys, you're done. <laughs> I want you guys in the comments to commit to us that you will do something in your backyard. You know, right now fall is for planting. You know, it is a beautiful, I mean, right here in Pennsylvania, it's a cool day today. It is a nice time to be outside. We have had rain. It's been kind of dry, I'd say, for for fall. However, fall, but let Mother Nature do the work in the rain for you. Fall is for planting. Get some of those golden rods, the asters, the, the varieties that Doug just talked about. And those are plants that will be in bloom now. Doug, it's important for people to choose plants that bloom, I mean, all four seasons, right? right, right. Something to provide for the pollinators in all four seasons. And right. I know Homestead can help you figure out what is the best plant for, I mean, your region, but also for your season because they need food in every season. My favorite fall blooming plants, best for pollinators would be Tell us. asters, all the asters, yes. the golden rods, um, um, blue lobelia is a really Ooh. good one. And white snake root is in bloom now. It's a, it's another really good one. But there you you're go, right. We need, we need those plants all season long. So, All right. So Melissa is saying, repeat the four key points. So number one, shrink the lawn. Number two, Let's remove well any like invasive it. ornamentals that you have. Yep. Uh, because they don't, if people say, oh, it stays on my property. Well, it's babies don't, <laughs> you know, they, right. the birds move those, those seeds around and they germinate about 35% of the plant biomass in our natural areas are plants from Asia that have escaped from our gardens. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're going to remove the invasives. You're going to plant those, those really powerhouse plants. Not all native plants support the food web, the way things like oaks and black cherry and hickories and, and, and uh, willows do. Uh, that's three. And then, then put in those plants for the pollinators. Yes. And I know, you know, if you have a small property, you might say, I don't have room to do all that. And, and that's probably true. If you have a big oak tree, it's throwing shade and you're not going to have enough, enough light for your pollinator garden. But think of your neighborhood as your local ecosystem and divide up the jobs. If you have the big oak tree, then somebody else doesn't have any tree and they got a lot of, a lot of sunlight. That's the person that should focus on the, the pollinator garden. This is a good way to meet your neighbors. You can actually work together. And I feel like during quarantine, at least for me, I've met more neighbors now than ever because people are out walking around more. You know, your kids are riding bikes. So it is a very active time for you to start having that conversation, especially when you have your pollinator gardens in your front yard. What a great conversation topic. 
So Doug just told us his favorite fall pollinating pollinator plants, which also because they're, you know, they're pollinator plants because they're in bloom now. You guys, that means your gardens will be beautiful all throughout the fall. You deserve to have a garden that is in bloom right now. If your garden's not in bloom, there are some few key plants Doug just said to add to the list. And I would add Black Eyed Susans. They're one of my favorites and they're the Maryland State Flower. Um, I know there's a lot of cultivars, Doug, that might not be as, uh, that are not native, but pick your Black Eyed Susans, go to Homestead to get that Black Eyed Susan. I came home from a vacation, Doug, first week of, of August. I left, my garden was pinks and purples, came back and it was yellow. The whole thing was yellow. And it's still, those Black Eyed Susans are still bright yellow in my garden. So I'd, I'd add that. Yeah, I didn't mention it because mine are done. I mean. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it is, you know, it's going to be October soon. So we're moving along. We are moving along. That's right. We're going to be putting our gardens to bed. So, well, I wanted to announce Homestead's native, let me make sure I have the right name, Habitat Center. Um, they just established this native Habitat Center. It was virtual native plant week a couple weeks ago. Was that the right name of it? Virtual native plant week, Doug? I don't know. <laughs> You had like seven Zooms that week. You're a yeah, busy who man. Knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, and Homestead wanted to, in conjunction with Virtual Native Plant Week, Homestead wanted to create their Native Habitat Center. And the center's goal is to educate. So events like this, bringing Doug to you to educate you about how to be a um, champion for pollinators. And one of those ways is natives. Now, Doug, let's talk a little bit about natives because I got a lot of questions about natives. Um, let me, if you guys have any questions out there, please please post them in, but you guys posted on the Facebook group. Um, so the first one is, and this one is from Sam Bayer. Sam asked, when selecting natives for his Maryland garden, is it good enough to pick any North American native hardy for his zone or should he find, okay, we've got the answer right there. Or should he find plants that are for his eco region specifically? Sure, I mean, you could plant uh, uh, Colorado blue spruce, which is native to the Colorado Rockies. It's not native here. You, what you want, the definition of native is a plant that has interacted with other species and plants in your area over evolutionary time. Colorado blue spruce has never met the plants in, in Maryland, uh, which means it's never met the, the uh, animals, the insects that use those plants. So it'll grow here just fine. You're not creating a native plant museum um, where you can visit all the plants of North America, you're creating the, the uh, number of plants that do well here. And you might say, well, that, that's not enough plants. We have something like 821 genera of native plants in the wow. mid-Atlantic states. It's plenty of plants. There's plenty, plenty of plants. Yeah, yeah. So you wanna focus on, on and people say, well, what, you know, what used to be here, it changes all the time. It does change all the time. Uh, when the glaciers push down, our, our native plant communities all move, move south. And when they retreated, they moved north. And they're always moving around. But um, they move at a much slower pace than we humans move them around, which is like overnight. Uh, so I would say um, anything that, is, that, that uh, was here, eh, let's, let's pick a date, say, you know, a thousand years ago. That, that would be a good native plant. Um, you know, the Indian, the, the Native Americans moved uh, corn and squash and, and Joe Pye weed and a lot of other things up, up north. Um, but it's, it's uh, the, the, the obvious ones are the ones from Asia. Those are the ones that we decorate yeah. our yard with or, yeah. or from Europe. If you live farther south, we bring a lot of South American plants on. It's obvious that they're not native. Yeah, well, he Sam elaborates on that question and says, should he care about a plant's origin or province? So he care about what the plant's doing. Got it. So I get I get emails uh, a couple times a year from people say, you know, ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from from China, used to grow in North America seven million years ago. That makes it a native. That means I can plant it. That's not our metric. It's not whether it's native or not. It's whether it's doing anything. Ginkgos support zero caterpillars. Hmm. Those oaks support 557. There's the difference. You're not going to have any breeding birds in your yard if all you have are, are ginkgos. Uh, so, and where do you find out what the plants are doing? You go to Native Plant Finder on National Wildlife Federation website. Native Plant Finder, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most productive plants for your county will pop up, both woody plants and herbaceous plants. 
It's a wonderful list at NWF that Doug helped them put together. And I know it's growing. You're working on additional lists for that website, aren't you? Going to add uh, pollinator specialists. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, work by Jared Fowler is is going to. I mean, he's got he's got a good handle on all the special po pollinator specialists in each region of the country. So that'll be a big Wonderful. addition. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we have another question from Heather. Heather's asking if cultivars of native flowers can be a problem. Yeah, that's that's the most common question I get. Uh, a cultivar is a genetic variant of that particular species, whether it's native or not. So if you have a cultivar of a native plant, it's it's one genotype of that native plant. It could be natural. A lot of cultivars are just genetic variants that people find in nature, like, like uh, Acer rubrum October glory. That was a red maple that just had really good fall color. And somebody <laughs> found it and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna sell that. Uh, so is that okay? Sure, that, that's okay. Uh, nature created that. A lot of cultivars have been selected uh, specifically for particular jobs. Uh, so, so some cultivars are there because they're good at, at repelling powdery mildew, disease resistance. All right. Other cultivars, you take a tall plant and make it short. You make the leaves variegated. A really common cultivar is to take green leaves and make them red or purple. Um, so do that, does that make a difference? And then there's a lot of cultivars focused on flower shape and color. Does it make a difference? The answer is it depends. It depends on what the genetic trait was that was changed uh, and how it affects the, the creatures you're targeting. So for example, we did a study looking at six cultivar traits of woody plants had nothing to do with flowers. It was all those other traits I mentioned. And the only trait that significantly reduced insect use was taking a red leaf and a green leaf and making it red or purple. Because that introduced anthocyanins to the leaf and that makes it unpalatable. Those are, those are, that's what gives you the red color. So you're taking uh, something that's nice and edible and the insects can reproduce on it and making it inedible. Oh, it's, tasty. It's, a, it's a native genotype, except now the leaves are red. So in that case, no, I would avoid those. Um, Heather or uh, Annie White at University of, of Vermont is looking at cultivars of flowers. That's a, lot, that's a lot more complicated because there's so many ways you can change a flower and there's so many cultivars, thousands and thousands of them that you can't look at all of them and say, well, this one's good, this one's bad. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's in general, the risk of messing up the relationship between specialist pollinators and their plant is much greater when you change flower shape, flower color, the UV spectrum on the flower petals that we can't even see, nectar load, uh, pollen nutrition, all of those things get changed and we don't even appreciate it. Um, and how does that impact the, the bees? Well, you know, people are looking at different things. Occasionally, you can actually increase the amount of nectar available with a cultivar. So that's a possibility. Yes. But typically when you, we enlarge petals to make them more showy, you're, you're fooling with the energy budget. Each flower has a energy allocated to it. And if the petals are much bigger, there's typically less, less nectar and less pollen available. Or if you make a double flower, that's taking the reproductive parts and turning them into pretty petals looks nice, but then it has zero um, benefit for any, any pollinators. Uh, so if you're, if you're concerned about function, ask for the straight species. And if your nursery doesn't carry the straight, straight species, don't buy anything else because the only way they're going to switch or at least add straight species to their inventory is if enough people ask for it. Great tips. Now you've mentioned, we have a couple other questions. Charlene, we'll get to yours in a minute, but you've been talking about generalists and specialists a lot. So I wanted to make sure everyone understood the difference between the two and why we should be focused a little bit more on our specialists. Okay, both both uh, many native bees and 90% of our, our caterpillars and the things that eat plants can only eat particular plants. Why is that? Because plants defend themselves. They don't wanna be eaten. So they, <laughs> they have all these defenses, chemical defenses and physical defenses. And the only way the insect can actually take advantage of that is to get around those defenses. So they, 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 um, they have adaptations to do that. Let's look at the monarch butterfly. It eats milkweeds and milkweeds are toxic plants. How do they do that? They have the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify cardiac glycosides. That's the nasties that's in milkweeds. They have a behavioral adaptation. They snip the midrib of the vein that blocks the flow of the latex sap, the white gooey stuff that gives milkweeds its name. Uh, and once they do all that stuff, then they can eat milkweeds without dying. 
If you don't have those adaptations, you can't do it. Wow. But in developing all those adaptations over the, the eons, they become locked into it. Now that's all they can eat. They have not developed adaptations to be able to eat in tobacco and on and on and on. Uh, so that's how uh, insects get specialized, but it locks them into that host plant. And that's why they can't eat those plants. That's why they can't eat your burning bush or your calorie pear. They, they haven't seen it before. It takes, it takes many thousands of generations to adapt to a new plant. And none of our ornamentals have been here long enough, including Phragmites. It's been here 400 years for our insects to adapt to it. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So, and I've also heard you say that if we are planting for our specialists, a lot of times, I mean, a lot of, as you mentioned, our insects are specialists anyway, but the generalists will find something to eat. They come, they can use the specialist plants. Right. So yes. for example, um, if you have goldenrod and you're, you're targeting the 12 species in Maryland that can only reproduce on goldenrod, the, the bees, the honey, the native bees, native bees. honeybees use goldenrod too. They do just fine. So do our bumblebees. Most of our bumblebees are pretty generalized. So if you plant for the specialists, you take care of the specialists. But if you plant for the generalists, like if you put in zinnias or butterfly bush, make lots of nectar and the, the you know, butterflies and bees go there, but none of the specialists can use them. Got it. All right. We have another question. Um, is that, well, it sounds like you just answered this question, but are honeybees and native bees competing for the same resources? Unfortunately, they are. Yeah. Um, you know, honeybees are great in our agricultural settings where we have giant, giant fields and they need to fly long distances. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, beekeepers, the, the pro one of the problems with honeybees is lack of forage. They need to eat all the time too, not just the one week the crop is in bloom. So you get large beekeepers and they, they have their bees uh, on, on the edge of natural areas or they'll get permission to put them in parks and things. Uh, and if, if all of our area was well planted, it'd be okay. But we're, we're so low in forage as it is that they definitely do compete with the, the native bees. Uh, and this is another reason to take half your area out of lawn. That lawn could be servicing a whole lot of bees uh, if you had the right, right plants in there. But right now it's particularly the way we grow it now. And there's not even white clover in there. You know, when you fertilize your yard, there's a, there's a uh, herbicide in there that kills anything but grass. You may not even know that. Uh, and that's why you have a perfect lawn, but it's perfectly dead. And so, you, so not perfect if, under if my had, criteria, if we had more flowers, yeah. The honeybees and the native bees could coexist better than they're doing now. But right now, the, the honeybees are really good foragers and they can outcompete our native bees um, just by overwhelming force in a lot mm -hmm. of situations. Mm, wow. All right. Another question is, OK, so this is pretty specific, but are native plants such as Simpson's rose and weed that bloom heavily for four months and provide large seeds for birds more beneficial for plants that only bloom for two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess they are. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the challenges is to have something blooming all season. Right. You mentioned, you know, we talked about fall plants, but you need early spring plants too. things like red bud, things that that are blooming before there are even any leaves out. Uh, the willows, that's where they, they contribute um, because the early season bees, that's, that's all they have. Our spring ephemerals burn bloom before the leaves of the big trees come out because that's the only time they have have uh, sun. Uh, then you, so a lot of things bloom in the spring, but then we move into the summer and it gets a, it gets a little, little tighter. The middle, maybe the end of July is a tough time, but things like button bush, uh, or, or clethra sweet pepper bush, that's when they bloom. Um, uh, bottle brush buckeye is another midsummer bloomer mm. and the butterflies and bees really, really like that because you can't go a month without eating. So any, any plant that blooms a long time is going to be uh, more beneficial than one. I and mean, that's the problem with button bush. Each flower is there for one morning. <laughs> yeah. And then the whole plant blooms, uh, it's done in about a week. And that's, yeah. I wish it would bloom longer. So. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, great. Let's see if we got all the questions. Feed your birds. I mean, I know obviously you've got plants and you have species and you have animals that are eating your plants that feed the birds, but do you still put up bird feeders at your house? I, I do, but not during the summertime. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to have a feeder during the warm months because the seeds can go rancid really easily. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do, you know, I'm supplementing it. Uh, we, we have a productive property, you're right, but everywhere around me is not. And um, I've heard ornithologists say, you don't have to feed the birds, they can find what they need. Not anymore, we've taken it away. If it was natural, they could find what they need. Yeah. But you know, our juncos and our, swall our, our uh, sparrows, uh, white-throated sparrow and, and several others come south and spend the winter here. They're eating seeds all winter long and they don't go to our feeders. They, they're eating the seeds out in, yeah. in nature. Now we've got such a terrible problem with um, Japanese stilt grass that is out competing a lot of our, our normal seed, seed makers. We need to supplement to make up for all of the natural food that we've taken away in most places. Every place we've paved, every place we have a house, there's nothing to eat. So, yep, bird feeders are good. And studies have shown that they, birds that have access to feeders enter the breeding season heavier. Uh, they can lay more eggs. So th they're healthier. When you do it properly, I mean, you can't, can't give them diseased seeds and you don't no. want to crowd a whole bunch of things in the same place. A lot of people get upset when the sharp shin hawk comes and picks off one of yours. It's a really good place to hunt. Um, of course, they have to eat too. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So we just got a question about the lawn because I know this is a very controversial topic. I have two little kids. We've got a swing set, a trampoline. Sarah here is asking about her dog. She says, I still have a dog. I need some lawn. Are there some inexpensive, she says, but seed mixes that you can create a lawn that you mentioned like clover, that you can create a lawn that still might be beneficial or not detrimental that you would suggest, as you said, the pathways through your garden. You know, what do you suggest for people who still need a little patch of grass? You know, those things will come in naturally. We call them weeds. And if you don't put the the weed killers on that's in your fertilizer, they'll they'll be there naturally and you don't have to worry about any any toxins. So things like white clover or dandelions, you know, they're the, the homeowner's bane, but they feed a lot of pollinators. So it's just a matter of tolerating the things that will come in naturally. Uh, and and leave your don't cut your grass so short. Maybe uh, maybe two inches to raise the mower so it's two yes. inch blades instead of one inch. Yep. It'll do better when it gets dry and it allows a lot of those plants to to bloom. Uh, but you know if you cut it on a regular basis, you can keep them in check and from a distance it looks perfectly green. So yeah, you won't we get one any... of the month award, but that's all right. <laughs> Right. You know what? Who cares? The grass is always greener. Their grass can be greener, but you've got you're supporting native species and pollinators. And you know that what you're doing is the, is the better thing. And um, you and still have a place for your dog in the bay, too. And you're not. So exactly. Yes. Yeah. So. All right. Well, you guys get your questions in because we've almost are wrapping up with Doug here. We've taken a lot of his time and we're so grateful um, for all that you've done. You have you were our inspiration for the Native Wildlife Center at Homestead Gardens. So you guys should check it out. You can find information about it in the Facebook group that we will post um, where you can join and learn more about native plants and what they do to support your local pollinators. But so, Doug, we talked about one action we can do to make, you know, to be nature's best hope. We talked, you talked about four things. So one thing we could do today. What is one thing that you would suggest people do today? Huh. Uh, yeah, I, you know, you can go out and find the red oak acorns have already fallen. All the red oak group has fallen. So that's, you know, that's willow oak, that's black oak, that's red oak, that's pin oak. Uh, you can collect those acorns. I wouldn't actually suggest planting them. Hold on one second, Doug, you froze. Okay, Sorry. you're back. Sorry. Okay. You're back. You said you wouldn't suggest planting them. Now. Okay. <laughs> because um, the rodents will get them over the winter. They don't germinate till the spring. So I would put them in a bag with peat moss uh, in a uh, little damp peat moss and put it in your fridge and the peat moss will keep fungus from growing and then I plant them in in the spring the white oak group things like white white oak and post oak and and uh, swamp white oak they do germinate in the fall you have to plant them in the fall um, you can put them in a flower pot excuse me the goal is to protect them from mice over the winter time okay so putting them in a flower pot, uh, they'll germinate, they'll send down their, their, their root, and then you can plant that in the fall, in the spring, sorry. 
The so easiest I, thing to do in the summertime to save billions of insects is turn out those lights or yes. put in a yellow bulb uh, because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive uh, to insect to you know to night insects. It's turning out that light pollution is one of the major drivers of insect declines. And it's one of those aha moments. I mean, last year in our garden media garden trends report, we talked about the windshield effect and you realize, oh, wait, you're right. There aren't any, I don't have to clean my windshield anymore. And when I read that in your book, I it brought me back to my childhood when I would go out on my front porch and it was swarming in the summer mm -hmm. with bugs, swarming. Mm -hmm. Now I go outside and there's barely a moth flapping around that light. And so it is one of those aha moments that you remember. I'm sure you all can remember back to when it was swarming. So that's that's what we want. That is a healthy ecosystem. We want those those moths swarming and then flick it off so then they can rest and they're not prey for bats, right, Doug? And that is what that's what that light really does, is it's exhausting them and it's making them easy prey. I'm sure there's other things as well. But it that was such an aha them moment. And dehydrates them and yeah. it actually blinds a lot of insects too. You know, yeah. Oh my goodness. And I would also add to that one thing you can do is make sure you're not cleaning up your gardens in fall. So now is a time when a lot of people are cutting their grasses back, cutting their gardens back, and there's really no need to do that. And in fact, it is not good for anybody. Your garden could be still beautiful. The cornflowers and the, the plants that turn brown, the grasses, they are still beautiful in the winter. And Doug, when would you suggest we, if we must clean up and cut back, when would you suggest we do that? Uh, late spring, you know what you're what you're losing is um, all the seed that's going to support those those birds over the the winter. Those those black eyed Susans you said, that's the Maryland state flower. Watch them. The the uh, um, goldfinches will come and eat one every one of those seeds all winter long. But not if you not if you deadhead it. No. So leave your garden. Uh, we're getting a lot of yeses for light pollution and saying that it is a major problem and that it is something that people are committing to make a change. And uh, Melissa is also saying you inspired the Maryland Park Services Create Your Own State Park Program. So right, if you guys man. read the book, you got to get the book. You'll learn more about that. Okay. So wonderful, Doug. I think you've answered everyone's questions and we have learned so much today about things that we can do immediately, things that we can do in winter, spring and fall and summer, all of the seasons. I don't want to miss summer. Um, it is our, it is our um, responsibility to make change and everybody can make change. I do often feel when, you know, the, this new book, Nature's Best Hope, it really did make me feel like I could make a difference. There are many things you guys can do to make a difference, not just the things we talked about in this show. So pick up a copy of Doug's book and uh, join along in the Native Habitat group on Facebook. And Doug, we thank you so much for joining us today. This was a lovely chat. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. And we'll be back Monday, October 5th at 12 to learn from an author and farmer, Jenny Peterson, and we'll learn about her wellness journey um, while she battled cancer and how plants helped her heal. And check out our events page for upcoming interviews and please RSVP there so you never miss one like you didn't want to miss this one. And sign up at Homestead Gardens for more exclusive content and offers. This program is made possible by the Garden Rewards Program. So please become a member because life should be beautiful. Right, Doug? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. All signing right. off. Everyone's saying thank you that it was wonderful. Doug, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.